All right, we're going to get started. I want to thank everyone for coming on to this Ames High School specific return to learn informational meeting. Uh, my name is Eric Smith. I'm the director of communications for the Ames Community School District. I'm going to provide um, just a bit of housekeeping items before I kick it over to Dr. Nyberg and her team for probably really what's going to be the rest of the evening. Um, as far as tonight goes, uh, Dr. Nyberg, she has a presentation. She did just tell me it was going to be about a half hour, so that's really good. Um, and then at that point, we're going to have opportunities for question and answer. So we're going to be able to do that two ways. Um, the first way is on the bottom, you can click on Q&A and ask your questions. Um, the team at Ames High, they're going to be taking a look at these questions, and they're going to be answering them throughout the night. So we might not wait until the end of the night just to be, to be able to answer just those questions. Um, but once we get through the meeting, um, or the presentation, excuse me, then we'll have an opportunity for any of our participants, um, which now we're up to 188, 190, I'm liking that, um, to be able to raise their hand. And so on the lower left-hand corner, you should be able to hit a button that says raise hand. And so when we get to that portion of the evening, um, you'll be able to hit that button. We'll be able to see you. We'll provide permissions to be able to um, ask your question directly. As you may have seen, um, we are, as a district, we are doing eight of these over the next three days. This is our third one tonight. Um, the first two went very well, and we know that there are a lot of question, questions that are very specific to um, the building that your student will be attending. And so that's what we really want to focus on for these meetings is that. Um, but with that said, Dr. Nyberg, I'm going to kick it over to you, and, and you have the floor for the rest of the evening. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, I want to reiterate, thank you very much for joining us tonight. I know that this takes away some time from your family and, and other um, evening activities. Um, I want to also thank the teachers and staff who helped to put this plan together. We had a, mem a 21 member um, team that really worked hard, uh, many, many evenings talking, discussing, and planning out uh, what you'll see here. And I want to thank them, as well as the teachers who responded to our various iterations, iterations as we put together these plans and kind of um, presented it to them for their feedback and, and questions. So uh, thank you so much so, to so many who have helped to put this together. Um, as Eric said, there are several um, team members on tonight and you will hear from each one of them for uh, at least a few slides. Uh, when they're not uh, speaking from their slides, I invite them to answer your questions in the chat uh, so that we can be, uh, we can expeditiously answer those questions and you don't have to raise your hand at the end. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and get started. I think it's really important to uh, ground this work, our approach, in uh, our vision and mission for the school year. So mm -hmm. our first uh, First section is our vision, our vision statement. So we are determined to prepare all students to become lifelong learners and active citizens within our community in order to meet the challenges of the future and attain their highest potential. This is whether or not they are uh, all online or in our building in a hybrid. This is what we have committed to. Um, our mission is in this time of difficulty and uncertainty. It is the mission of the Ames High administrations, teachers, and staff to provide an equitable and dynamic educational experience to all students. You'll see uh, as we go along in our presentation how dynamic that can be and, and what various uh, ways we will provide education to our students this year. Um, and specifically, based on our vision and our mission, we are committed to building relationships um, to remove better barriers and provide supports, recognizing the role of flexibility during these complex times, maintaining a growth mindset, understanding that each student has a potential for growth and they bring with them assets, using the essential standards, whether they are online, all online or at hybrid, we will utilize these standards for uh, to plan for our instruction and provide students with uh, timely feedback and engage, engage them, as well as use data to provide intervention supports um, that are differentiated to uh, each student's needs and communicate effectively with uh, to support our students, parents, and other stakeholders. Uh, this was a very important um, 
point for our team that uh, we want to make sure that we establish a two-way communication um, system with our families so that everyone um, is a part of the team because we can't do this without all of you as well. So this is where I am gonna take over. My name is Nicole Patton and I am the AP here at um, Ames High School. So what we're gonna do is we're each gonna take a couple of different slides and um, be able to share out to you. So um, as we look at a home-based screening, we really see this as a partnership with you guys. At home, we need you uh, to be able to also screen your children before they come to school. Monica, uh, our nurse, and um, Valerie got together and they actually created a daily home screening for students. If you click on that, that is a link that will take you there. And it's just a really nice checklist that you can go through um, for symptoms that you might see in your child. Or actually there's another um, checklist right after that about close content, uh, contact or potential exposure. Um, that you might have uh, had or your child might have had. And those are checklists that you can kind of look at. What we really want you to know is if you're not feeling well, stay home. It's okay, it's better that way. We, want, we would rather be safe than sorry. Um, of course, we wanna engage in hand washing and covering those sneezes and coughs. Um, these are just things we really want you to have conversations with your students about. Um, we want to also teach and reinforce wearing those cloths, the cloth face covering regularly. Now you might have seen on social media today, we did put out um, what kind of face coverings we will allow and won't allow. We do not want those vented face coverings and we don't want those that have mesh. So we want those solid face coverings that cover the nose and the mouth. Um, so we can kind of protect everybody that way. We also want to discourage sharing items um, just really a, a good idea. And then also, um, if you can bring your own lunch, if it's possible, if not, that's fine. Um, and kind of bring your own snacks. We don't wanna share those. We know in high school, kids will uh, kind of grab food from each other or whatever. Um, so we wanna avoid that. Um, we really see this as a partnership to be able to uh, have a positive experience in this crazy time. So we wanna go over some of the entrance and exit doors that we do have. Um, our entry points are gonna be our north bus door. So that's the one closest uh, to the front of the school. Um, also our main door will be an entry point and then our auxiliary door, which is um, the one, the old, the lobby doors by the uh, principal's office. It's the old principal's office because the principal is now housed in the student services area. And then also the activities door will be the entryway. Our exit points will be that north science hallway door. So that's the north door that is closer to the back of the school on that north side. Um, and then also the, that auxiliary office will also be an exit door. And then the pool breezeway. And that's just to really help the flow um, so there's less contact. So we're not going really close to each other as we enter or exit. Um, and the reason why we can have that auxiliary one is there's a lot of different doors there so we can go through them. Um, to go on, our meals, our, our, our building traffic patterns. So what we did is we are actually gonna have um, one-way hallways and one-way stairwells. Um, I think I've gotten like, when we were doing this, we were doing like 10 to 11,000 steps a day going through the building um, to make sure that this was um, easy. Uh, but we are gonna give the students six minute passing now. Uh, we are giving a longer passing period because we understand that they're gonna need that because of the one-way hallways. Hallways are marked with um, a one-way, sticker and then we call it a spirit arrow um, and then also uh, stairwells are marked um, which way is up and which way is down so the kids really need to watch uh, the floors it's kind of right it reminds me of going to Hy-Vee and Walmart right now actually so um, we will also use stanchions uh, in our large areas we do not want those kids congregating we know the areas they like to congregate and we are gonna use them to kind of funnel in just like you would be going to a ride on an amusement park at Adventureland or Disney World. They are gonna keep walking. Um, and we are, um, as a, a staff, going to encourage them to keep walking. Um, the, also, uh, we will be walking the halls and just monitoring them to make sure that they are moving from class to class. 
we understand that they're excited to see each other. We're excited. We're excited for them to come back too, but we really need to stress not stopping talking and having uh, conversations in between those periods and using those six minutes to really get to where we need to go. And then we also go on to meal service and seating. Um, what we've done now is we um, actually have plexiglass between our lunchroom tables. In our lunchroom, there will be two students per table. And um, because the table is uh, shorter than the allowed distance, we are putting plexiglass there. Um, students will actually have that same seat each day. So what we're gonna do, we know choice is a really big thing for high school students. So we're gonna kind of let them sit where they want to that first day. And then um, that is gonna be exactly uh, where uh, they're gonna stay for the rest of the year. Um, and uh, we're gonna be also purchasing some additional tables and chairs because we're not sure we have enough of that. Um, and then there will be three lunches and three different locations. The locations will be the lunchroom, the library, and then um, the um, courtyard outside. We will be accepting cash for a la carte, um, but the change is gonna go into your lunch account. So we are allowing that uh, cash for that a la carte, but like I said, that the change is gonna be going back into your account. Our breakfast is gonna be grab and go with a la carte cho uh, choices. Our lunches will be pre-packaged with everything disposable. Um, and that will also have a la carte choices. There is a closed campus. We know this can kind of be a big deal. We're not trying to be really mean, but when we have your students in our school, it's our job to keep them safe among these four walls we have them in. And so we really feel uh, the best way to do that and to lessen the chance of any kind of spread is to keep them here when they're supposed to be here and not have them running out to lunch to um, come in contact with really anyone else. And that's why that decision was made. Um, we need to make sure they either have a stylus or a pen to be able to punch in their menu number. And then also um, students will have to remain masked um, while, um, not while they're eating, but until they start eating. And then also they need to stay seated until the bell rings. So I am gonna pass it over to Jeff now. Mute. Hi everybody, I'm Jeff Anderson, the other associate principal at Ames High School and I appreciate your, your time tonight um, as well very much. Um, just to kind of go back a little bit on the, on the lunch, um, we wanted to kind of give you an idea of when we're talking about our, our uh, hybrid, the two different hybrids things. So we're looking at the, the number of students in the building for the phased in hybrid. This is kind of what we're looking at right now. Um, based upon having about 350 students that have requested the virtual campus at this time. Um, we're anticipating about uh, 275 students a day. That would put us at about uh, anywhere from five to 10 students in a class. Um, and then for the lunches that Nicole just talked about, that would be about 92 students um, in each one of those three different um, lunch shifts. So when we switch to the 50% hybrid, obviously that would pretty much double um where we'd have the kids coming in uh, twice a week versus once and uh with 550 students um that would give us about 10 to 18 students in a class and we would uh, have about 184 students in each one of those lunch shifts so in the in the classrooms um we just talked about the numbers but uh in the classroom configurations um, we're looking for spaces to try to keep kids socially distance at six feet apart. Um, we're gonna have to have seats in the same direction. It's kind of back to the rows thing again, which isn't always probably the best configuration for learning, but it is the best for maintaining social distancing. Um, you will also need to make sure that uh, teachers have we'll, uh, strict seating charts. We need this in order to make sure that we have accurate, um, we we're very, can be very accurate with our trace and any context that students may come in if the need arises to have that information. So we really need to know kind of where kids are um, at all, all times during the day. And then as far as sanitation is concerned, we are asking our teachers to take soft items out, the porous items that we're talking about couches, some of the chairs uh, that can't be cleaned properly. Um, we're asking for some of those things to be kind of taken out. Um, we're also 
want to uh, we'll make sure we want you to know that each te teacher is going to have a supply of uh, paper towels and sanitation spray bottles that uh, we'll be wiping down desks after each class when the students are using them. Um, classes are going to have each one of our classes are going to have sanitizer bottles. Uh, we're going to get touchless ones. We hope to have them before school started, but they are on back order. Um, so we'll be able to get those in um, as, as the school year goes, but we will have sanitizer bottles in each one of our classrooms. And then um, each teachers are going to remind students to wash and sanitize or sanitize their hands after when they enter the classes. They'll continually remind them of that. Um, face coverings. This is, uh, we've spent a lot of time talking about this as well um, as a district really. And the districts are gonna have a face covering for each one of, uh, provided for each one of the, uh, our students. Um, if, and I'm gonna say when, uh, students forget they're gonna have a, we will have a disposable covering for them. Um, students are gonna be asked to have their face coverings on from the time they come to school to the time they leave, except obviously when they're eating. And um, we've been asked a little bit about face shields and we're still maintaining that we need to have a, a mask uh, because obviously they, they, the CDC is recommending this and that they, we still need to have the mask even if there is a face shield in place. So the other question that we're getting a lot is, okay, what are you gonna do when kids are refusing to wear their masks? We're gonna, we're gonna work with all of our kids just like we always do. We do, um, we're gonna work with them. We're gonna try to make sure we understand the issues for why they're not wanting to wear the masks. But um, the, the obvious thing, the bottom line for, for this thing folks is that if we're gonna be successful in preventing transmission of this virus in schools, we need to be wearing masks. Um, it's just the bottom line. And we're sure that our Ames High students are gonna come through and find colors of that. Um, this page is going over some process and procedures. Another thing that we really wanted to go through is, okay, we notice students uh, or faculty for that matter, but in this case for students that are maybe showing some signs of uh, that COVID could be sus a suspected illness. We do have signs throughout the building right now, um, putting some of these uh, illness, uh, uh, things in play, you know, in, in play and letting students know what to watch for. But if we do um, the procedures that we're going to do, if the student is showing that uh, symptoms of COVID virus, the student can let their teachers know and they'll be written a pass and that pass will have an S on it. And that's for suspect, obviously. Um, we have designated a separate area for an isolation uh, treatment room in our nurse, nurse's office. So students, if we're, if we're showing signs of uh, possible COVID uh, infection, they will be isolated. Um, any other issues where students need to come to the, to the um, nurse's office, they will go in through a separate door. They'll go in through a different door of the main office door and then go to a different treatment area. So we're gonna keep these, these spots um, very separate. And then if a student needs to be picked up due to you know, the suspected uh, COVID illness, um, we'll have a number to call. It, it's listed right there. And then uh, the student will be escorted out um, to the car so that you don't have to come in and um, we don't have to, we try to isolate everything as, as possible as we can. And from there, our nurse will work with the parents on, on next steps of what needs to happen um, after that. Good evening, I'm Ben Matthews. I'm one of the alternative teachers and credit recovery uh, teacher at Ames High School. And I'm gonna talk about kind of our bell schedule um, for both the uh, uh, phase in approach as well as the 50%. Um, and so as you can see through the presentation for the uh, phased in approach where we're gonna have 25% of our students um, in the building, we're gonna run an eight period day. Um, so it's important that we are able to see our students since they're only going to be in the building, um, well, one day a week. And so we want to run the eight period day. Of course, that would be, you know, we're going to see the students on Monday and then we won't see them again until the next Monday. And so um, with that, um, as I think Nicole said, 
uh, we are going to have three lunches. And so as you can see there, the lunch periods will be between fifth and sixth period, depending upon whichever group they are labeled in. Um, so, and our, of course, our school days from 7.50 to 2.30. So can I get the next slide? Thank you. Um, once we are past the four weeks, the plan is to move into the 50% model where kids will be blended if they were on the Monday, Tuesday um, route or cohort, they'll be blended into the Monday, Tuesday day days. Um, and we're moving into a block um, period where we will meet um, for four periods on either Monday, Tuesday, or then we'll meet Thursday, Friday for the second half of the week. Um, again, we'll still have the three lunch periods, um, but we have interventions built into every day. So we'll between first and second period will be our plus period um, on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, and then also if you note here, we do have our B lunch would actually split that third block, um, just kind of a little note there. Um, whereas the A lunch and the C lunch would fall um, outside of the class period, okay? Uh, and then Wednesday would be a different schedule uh, because Wednesday, the intent would be, we would still have an eight period day. And it is more of kind of our intervention day with the intent of, it's kind of that catch up day. Everyone's in the building, um, everyone can see all their teachers and, it's just designed as that intervention day because it's kind of that offset day. It's kind of that, I think we were calling it kind of the pivot day um, because you know one week we have the A group on Wednesday, the next week we have the B group on Wednesday. So um, we felt that was kind of a better way uh, to use our time at the high school was to use Wednesday as kind of our intervention day. So thank you. Back to you, Valerie. Sorry, I, I uh, pushed the wrong button. Um, I know there have been a lot of questions from um, both staff and, and, and uh, fa families about music. Um, so we are taking the band and breaking it into smaller ensembles that will be per period so that we don't have the, the very large groups anymore. Um, because of the, the numbers, our vocal choir and our orchestra, particularly when we're in the 25% hybrid, don't feel that they need to break into smaller groups. Um, orchestra might, one of their groups might break into a, a smaller group for the older grades. Uh, while we're in that first phase of a hybrid, we're still looking at the numbers on that. Um, but they should, by and large, remain fairly uh, the same. Um, and then for vocal, when we go into the 50%, we might shift that where the location is for that class so that they can move into the auditorium where there's much more room um, and rather than keeping it in choir. Um, for students who select um, online only, they can con continue to participate in these programs either in person or remote. Um, I've talked with the teachers and they're all planning um, to have ways of uh, facilitating that development and um, continued growth throughout the school year, whether they see their students or if students are uh, working from home. PE, based on the guidelines that we've gotten, we are uh, capping our classes at 27 students. Um, this is mostly because most, most periods we run uh, three PE classes, so there is some um, close proximity and we don't want to, we want to make sure that we don't um, have too many students in the same spaces. So we are looking to uh, reduce those size, sizes and then also use our outdoor facilities whenever possible um, based on the weather. Uh, in the past, it's my understanding that in the past, Ames High has, has uh, moved away from having a, assigned study halls. Uh, this year for contact tracing, we're not going to use a flex period. Instead, students who have open periods will be assigned a study hall and will be expected to attend their study hall like other classes. Um, we are working uh, to arrange some uh, um, 
some open, like if you're an upperclassman, like a senior, we're working to arrange those schedules so that students can have their study hall or the open period at the beginning or the end of the day, and then they can be released so that they don't have to attend. We don't want to put any students in classes when they don't necessarily need to be there, but we do need to continue contact tracing. So when students have open periods, they have to have a study hall. I wanted to go over some options for the all online or a hybrid remote learning. Uh, right now, we are looking for a lot of the facility of this option of, through Edgenuity. The reason for this um, move is at the high school levels, mo most teachers have anywhere between uh, two to three um, different preps. So they're teaching two or three different classes. Some of our teachers, like our music teachers, our art teachers, and, and some of our, our elective teachers are teaching anywhere between five and six preps. So to ask those teachers to be able to, to run all of their classes and, and prepare for all of their classes, as well as all of the students who were working remotely was a, a little bit of a heavy lift. So we're, we're, we've asked the district to provide some additional support, and that is through Edgenuity. Actually, I have some experience with Edgenuity. It is um, very customizable. So uh, teachers, we're, we're asking our uh, department chairs and teachers to look at the offerings within the courses uh, to determine what standards they're, they're going to cover in this the, the grading period and to customize their those courses based on what they're doing in class so that when students come back, they are at par, on par with their students. We will, will heavily rely on our essential uh, standards for, for that work. Um, in addition, students who are working um, in that all online will have a high school teacher or teacher from Maine's High work with them remotely. I, I, I've started to call this kind of like an, a virtual homeroom teacher. That teacher will be responsible for checking in on them, making sure that they're making um, adequate pro progress, and then connecting them with, with any teachers that they might need for uh, content specific help. And then we are uh, considering on a case by case basis for students who have selected uh, all online, uh, what uh, in person classes we can offer them based on the situation and, and based on uh, the staffing at that level. Uh, one of the things I thought would be helpful is kind of what, what's similar and what's different between the, the 25 and 50% hybrid and the virtual campus. Uh, the same is we're using essential standards and learning targets to guide our instruction. We're providing rigorous and re relevant instruction to each of our students. We're providing um, frequent free feedback. The, we're making decisions based on uh, interventions and supports based on data. data. Um, and we're providing those, those supports and assistance to students. Uh, no student will be penalized, whether they are in the 25, 50% hybrid or virtual um, for their graduation prog progression. So I wanna make that clear. We will work really feverishly to make sure that no student is negatively impacted by going to all online. And uh, students who have selected all online can participate in, in it, it, both hybrid and online can participate in sports and extracurriculars. So uh, what the hybrid, what's different is the hybrid will have some in-class in, in class or synchronous face-to-face -face, um, learning as well as some asynchronous learning. The campus is largely asynchronous, but can have some um, synchronous components to it. Uh, like I said earlier, there'll be students will be assigned to a kind of homeroom teacher and um, that homeroom teacher will facilitate uh, getting those interventions. Another way of looking at what it will look like for because high school is complicated and we have students who have a number of different programs and a number, a number of different emphasis. So we don't want to take away options, but we do want to make sure that we facilitate uh, op the, the best options we can and that we're not overtaxing either students or staff. So under uh, student A, who's in the hybrid, either the 25, 25 and 50%, you can see that they would uh, ideally 
uh, come to school that, that during that first section of the 25, they would come to school on Monday. Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, they would go to Google Classroom for their coursework and uh, follow along with their class. So each day, the teacher who is teaching in person will continue that, that instructional progress even though they're not seeing all their students. Wednesday will be that intervention and support time as well as uh, some office hours and some additional assistance from teachers. In the 50% model, uh, just like uh, um, ben said earlier, the groups one and two will collapse into uh, a single group. They will attend on that Monday and Tuesday with a block schedule. Wednesday, every other Wednesday, they will attend with a one, one through eight period schedule. And that was really to facilitate additional contact time with their teachers. Uh, teachers felt really strongly that they wanted to see their students more often. So uh, that's why we did the one through eight. And then they would be on the Google Classroom, using Google Classroom on Thursday and Friday. Um, looking at the course requirements and the kind of like, if you're thinking about Carnegie uh, units, uh, we're looking at perhaps about 3.2 hours per week that a student is engaged in uh, online education per um, one unit of credits. And um, students who have significant needs, um, we are working with the district to have them attend four days per week. For student B who has chosen the all online or the hybrid two, their classes will be online through Edgenuity. Um, which I said earlier is customizable by our teachers. They can still find that support and intervention on Wednesday and that check-in with teachers as well on that day. Um, and then student C, in some cases, for example, I'm thinking um, AP Euro is a, a perfect example. Uh, we, Edgenuity doesn't offer an AP Euro class. So we're working with teachers to be able to provide uh, some of those classes uh, remotely uh, to students so that students can, can, can continue to take them and we can continue to offer them. So they might have their English class might be through Edgenuity, their math class might be through Edgenuity, but their social studies class like an AP Euro would be um, through uh, uh, a cla Google Classroom. Um, in that case, the teacher would reach out to them and have slate them in one of those um, one through for uh, blocks so that students can uh, attend virtually and, and work with them individually to, to work out those norms and those expectations. Hi, I'm Eileen Sullivan. I'm gonna talk a little bit about teaching expectations in both of these models. So as Valerie shared earlier, our commitments are to communicate effectively, to keep a growth mindset, and that has to do with our proficiency scale that's mentioned there in bullet number two, and to use our data going beyond grades. So to answer a question in the chat as well, synchronous is real time live, whether it's live in a classroom or if it's live with me in front of a screen and a student um, at home. Um, asynchronous is the type of work that you can do anytime. So for instance, a teacher would post something or perhaps on Edgenuity, something would be posted and then students could do that at their own pace and on their own time. So for all of our models, we're going to be looking at synchronous and asynchronous expectations. So real time as well as um, time on their own. So in these expectations, then we're looking at communication with um, checking in for checking in with students and communicating with students and families. We are going to use a proficiency scale, which is coming up next for you to see um, that has to do with our growth mindset and getting better and really concentrating on learning what we can learn this year. Um, and then some small group interactions um, based on data. So things that we collect, we can find out what students know and what they need to know and where they need to move. Then our expectations for in-person and online learning. We have another continuation of the commitments to our students. So you'll notice in these bullets that building relationships are important. Um, the use of essential standards as already mentioned tonight is very important as well. So these are things that we've identified to be essential to our coursework and what we want our students to know and be able to do at the end of their courses and then using um, data. And data is not just a grade or a score on an assignment, but how students are doing in class, what things are telling us, formative types of assessments are just things that we notice. Um, some commitments we've made for our in-person online learning to make sure that we're all keeping up with things is that um, learning 
standards and pardon me, learning targets and essential standards will be posted for classes by Sunday evening for that hybrid model. So students by Sunday evening, they can take a look and see what am I gonna be doing this week? Because we know we're not gonna be seeing all of our students every day. Then the other um, timeline that we have in place is by 4 p.m. on Friday of each week, anything that's been graded for points, any assignments will be updated and posted um, to Infinite Campus so that students and parents can keep track of what's going on. I just want to take a moment to um, remind our team that we're a little behind. So uh, Missy, you're up next. All right, thanks. I'm Missy Carlson. I'm one of the learning leads at the high school and our implementation team worked on uh, defining uh, and talking about what engagement would look like. Um, we think it's really important to have clarity for students, parents, teachers, and administration on what, what we're expecting. So, um, so you can see there's kind of four different levels we've identified. The proficient is what we're expecting or asking of students. Um, so that means regarding behavioral engagement that they're doing things, right? That's what we normally think of when we, when we talk about engagement. So they're working on the assignment, they're there, they're asking questions. Um, to the fundamental, kind of the bare minimum, so to speak, is what a student would be if they're just present. They've attended class. So you can see synchronously, whether that be, um, this is the in-person. Uh, so if they're in the room, they're gonna be counted as present. Um, and asynchronously, so on those days that they're uh, learning at home, um, they've logged into Google Classroom or they've completed like the infinite campus attendance check. So all they've done is checked in that they, they've made it. Um, developing is, they're, they're working, um, but maybe not, really fast, right? Like they're, they're kind of dragging their feet a little bit and then you can see the exceeding is um, going above and beyond. In addition to behavioral engagement, we've talked about cognitive engagement. So behavioral is looking at um, what we see students doing. The cognitive engagement is the quality of that engagement. So, um, so how much are they kind of actively got their brain working? So, um, so the proficient level is they're making connections, they're working with uh, partners, they're, they're putting their own thoughts and ideas into things. Um, again, that bare minimum is what we sometimes see students like, they're just getting the job done, right? Like they're checking the box that they did the assignment. So what we're really asking for students for proficiency is that they're, they're cognitively engaged, they're, they're working their brain. Oh, I'm not muted, sorry. <laughs> I apologize, everyone. Um, as we wrap up our presentation, I just wanted to, to put some dates in front of you. This is still in draft form, but just so you know, uh, kind of what the transitions for the first semester from online to in-person and in-person um, to online will look like. I don't want to get get go into that in too much detail, but this is just an, an idea of what we're looking, what those uh, transition points will be. And so uh, now we are ready to take hand-raised questions. Nice, thanks uh, Ames High team. I will also, um, point us that there might be some opportunities to answer some questions in the Q&A on the bottom so we can answer some of those live. Um, if you want some of your team to look through those, we can answer some of those live, but also um, finish writing some of them. But we will go to our first uh, question. I am given permission to, it is an Iowa State email address, M. Rosati. Hi, my name is Marcia Rosati and I live at 2732 Meadowland Road my the mother of a freshman who is gonna be online. My question is, I would like to know how much synchronous teaching my child will get as being all online. It, it wasn't very clear. It seems it's only on Wednesday. Exactly what are they going to be doing on Wednesday? Thank you very much for that question. It's a, at this moment, it's a little hard to, to dial in on a specific number of hours. Uh, what I can say is uh, when your student has uh, uh, needs and assistance, whether it be that virtual 
um, homeroom teacher or whether it be from a content expert, uh, they will get that, that assistance um, in a time frame that will help them to move on to the next um, point. Uh, it really depends on, like right now, the admin team and counselors are really looking at each student's schedule to assess what, what classes um, will be run through Edgenuity and then what classes will be offered um, through the like a, a online Google platform. So those things will, will vary based on the combination of how your student schedule comes out. Does that help to explain? Sort of, but that means a student who doesn't need help will never see a teacher, correct? Uh, not necessarily that, that I, I don't believe so because it is our aim to build those relationships. So at some point they'll have to see a teacher. Valerie, I might add um, to that where we will have AIMS teachers facilitating um, students. So students will be rostered to an AIMS teacher and there will be some components um, often throughout the week of daily or of check-ins and some community mm -hmm. building, um, making sure that, that if students have questions, we're available to answer those um, as well as the academic support um, by various staff. All right, Brian, you can go ahead and ask your question. Um, yeah, so my first question, my first thought was, I, it was kind of on that same line, um, listening to the school board meeting yesterday, I got a much more of a feeling that there was going to be more synchronous communication with our students if we chose 100% online than what I'm feeling I'm hearing today, which is a little more concerning and I may have to rethink my thoughts on that. Um, but that aside, um, one question I had was based on the school board yesterday, they came out with some metrics that were to determine um, when the school might switch between the different models from fully on campus to the hybrid to 100% online for everybody. Um, is there any communication or any thoughts on how that is going to work? Is that an automatic thing? Is that something that has to go through the school board? Um, when do those metrics get looked at? So is there any clarification that you guys can give us on how that process um, might proceed as things change within our community? I feel like that's a question I could answer. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, my computer is a little unstable. So um, I heard the first part of your question in which you were saying something about the metrics um, and that the school board rolled out yesterday and then I cut out. So can you finish that? I'm sure, so sorry. I can, I can restate it. Um, basically what I'm looking for is that they came out with these metrics that show us when they'll switch between the different models. Can you give us more clarification on how that's going to be implemented? Is that a something that has you to bet. go back to the school board? Does it is there a specific date you that bet. they're going to look at and say, okay, if the metrics on this, you know, all those detailed information would be helpful for me. Sure. Thanks for the question, Brian. Um, yes, we will um, be watching that daily. We'll watch uh, the the metrics daily. So our data. Um, we have somebody, actually, you heard her speak last night, Kathy Arnold, yeah. she's on here tonight. She'll be watching that data on a daily basis. Um, if we see something that moves us into a different learning model, um, we call a special board meeting and um, we make the recommendation to the board based on the metrics. And then the board would act on that um, information. Okay, and so at that point, the board could choose to either follow the metrics or not, but that's up to them. Is Correct. That what I'm understanding. Yep. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Much. Yep. John, you can go ahead. Yeah, and I'm sorry if I missed this at the very beginning. Um, we're leaning very strongly towards uh, our daughter being 100% virtual, 
but she is or was signed up for weights class. And I'm wondering how that works. We're still working on those finer details. Um, as you can imagine, um, we, there isn't an online component for that. So we're still uh, in the process of working out particular PE and, and what that will look like for students. Thank you. Jeremy, you can go ahead. Yeah, can you tell me how the students will be divided into the four separate uh, groups for the 25% sections for the in-person learning? Sure. So for the, once we have a, a solid group of students who have selected online, all online, um, we will take the remaining students and utilize Infinite Campus to, uh, to balance them out and to assign them to, to the various groups. So we're looking to have our, our schedule finalized in the next week or so to facilitate that process. Okay, great, thank you. Olivia, go ahead. Using my daughter's account. Uh, I'd like to know, uh, I think you answered a little bit this question about uh, all PE and online uh, students and my another uh, another section would be uh, about the orchestra and band. I have two kids that is in the orchestra and one is in band. How that online learning for them would look like? With that will, thank you very much for your question. That will be facilitated through Google Classroom. Those teachers are already preparing those lessons and those videos and those interactions with uh, students so that they continue to uh, progress in their musical education. Uh, for example, our ba band teacher uh, just, our band director just sent uh, earlier tonight a video of him helping a student fix her clarinet um, virtually without ever having to be in the same room. So uh, those, those teachers are working on that platform even as we speak. Thank you. Karen, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just wondering how my son is supposed to make a decision about being online versus the in-person hybrid when he doesn't know what classes will be offered in that model. So when is the decision going to be made? What classes in the Edgenuity platform are going to be offered at Ames High this year versus him being in person? It's, I guess, time sensitive because he's a senior, so he has very specific courses he wants to take. So when does that decision get made? When does that course catalog get released? When does, when does he know these classes and what his schedule could be if he's online versus in person? Thank you very much for that question. Uh, the course catalog for the for Iowa's uh, courses are are is linked to the return to learn plan that's already on the district website. Uh, it's the first several pages until you get to the um, added on classes. I think those are like the last three pages. So those first uh, few pages with the course courses is what we've been looking at to determine, uh, to look at what students' schedules are and to match them up. In addition, we're in the process of working with several teachers right now, um, like I said earlier, to offer uh, their courses uh, through, on, or through Google Classroom because they are specialty classes. So uh, I can work with you and, and, and the counselors to kind of figure out what his schedule looks like. So he should make his choice to be online and then you guys will work with him to get him the courses that he needs? Is that what you're saying? Essentially, yes. If, he, if that's what he wants to do, yes. Okay, thank you. Laura, you can go ahead. So to understand, make sure I understand the online option. It sounds as if it's similar to signing up for a digital high school somewhere else um, with the idea that the student would potentially be able to come back into the Ames High class. But as far as being taught by Ames High teachers, that doesn't sound like that really is a major component of the online education. Yes and no, it depends on the course. 
um, for, for example, AP Euro is a, a perfect example. That class is not offered through Edgenuity, but it is, um, we are going to continue to offer it uh, through one of our teachers through uh, Google Classroom. So uh, your initial description is fairly correct, but we plan to have a lot of hands on deck, if you will, to facilitate the teaching and learning for students because we don't wanna lose that rigor, that relevance, and uh, we wanna main, maintain those strong relationships with our students. And so if a student is struggling in one of those online courses, the idea is that then a teacher that's teaching that course for Ames High would be assisting them on Wednesday? Uh, that th the idea is that the virtual homeroom teacher would connect that teacher with that content expert and they can work on Wednesday for uh, that reteaching or that that specific um, assistance he's, he's needing. Yes. Thank you. Megan, you can go ahead. Hello, this is Megan Wolf, and I have two high schoolers who have um, no interest in remote learning. Um, they are both very active in band and chorus. And my question is, last night during the board meeting, it sounded like students who are doing virtual learning, in addition to having those courses online, they would also be allowed to come to the building to do participate in person in band and chorus. Did I understand that correctly? It's an and, it's an or not an and, so yes. Um, so students who are all online have the choice to come just for that band class or just for that orchestra class or to do that all online. Okay, so then I would ask, how does that is assist with contract um, tracing? And are those people able, those students able to come more frequently? For example, my son is only going to get to participate in band and chorus four times, probably three, the month of September. But if he chose online learning, would he have the flexibility to, which he won't, but if he did, he would be able to come every day for band and chorus? I, I understand that. Yeah, I thank you very much. That is a good uh, dis the distinction. No, they would be assigned a rotation just like uh, the hybrid students and would come on that assigned day and time just that once. Um, for contact tracing, they would be expected to come in the building just for that class and leave right after that class. And they would also have an assigned seat with, while they're in that class so that we can make sure we, uh, we know where they've been. Excellent, thank you very much. Tracy, go ahead. Um, I have a question regarding exams and assessments. Could you please explain for online in-person student learning, how will exams and assessments be conducted? For example, the final exam, will it be the same exam given to students, um, whether they are learning through uh, Edgenuity or in the in-person model? That's a tough one. Um, I can go ahead. So um, since I'm, I oversee our online learning at Ames High, um, with Ingenuity or we actually use Apex Learning for our system as well. Um, the, the final exam is generally a, um, it alternates, it has a bank of questions and so the exams are always different uh, depending upon what year you may take it. So like the even year, it's this exam, the odd year, it's this exam. Um, but then like if you're sitting next to someone, it may be um, their exam is completely different. Their questions are out of order. Their options, if it's a multiple choice exam are out of order. Um, if it's an essay, their essays may be a little bit different. So that's the Edgenuity um, 
piece is very similar. So um, are you saying that the Edgenuity students or Apex online students will take a different exam than for the same course than the they inline could. in they class could. student? They could, but we could also rewrite it. We're able to customize both um, contents. So we can write our own exams and put them in. Uh, that is one reason why we're looking at using Edgenuity um, is that it does allow us to customize and put in our own activities and exams. Um, and so that's one thing that we can use with our content experts is they can say, hey, I really want to put this activity in um, so that the online, 100% online learners can get this experience just like my classroom learners. And so then they can still do that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Isaac, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I just had a question about or two about uh, the lunch schedule. Um, a, are they um, cleaning tables and chairs between uh, periods and B, if you're a junior or senior, are you allowed to leave and eat at home for lunch if you're on the hybrid model? Um, so yes, that's why we've um, set our, our lunch schedules where they're about 20 minutes apart to facilitate that cleaning. Uh, the Cartwell uh, cafeteria folks will uh, clean the cafeteria and the building custodians will clean the um, library and uh, the folks who are um, supervising the uh, courtyard will clean the courtyard. So there is that time built into to the schedule to facilitate that. And um, at this point, no uh, upperclassmen will be asked to stay on campus because we don't know where they go when they leave. Um, in addition to that, with our parking situation, it takes it's going to take a lot longer to get back and forth from the building to parking. And so that really cuts down on their time. And I don't want anyone to get in an accident while they're trying to rush from one place to another. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Kent, go ahead. Hey, just a quick question. Is Superintendent Reisner still on here? I am. Um... So I guess my question just, it kind of involves the cohort and, and you know, so is the plan when, when we do the phased in 25%, you know, at the elementary level, is it, you know, one section of first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and same with, with middle school and, and high school? Do you have like a freshman, co freshman cohort, sophomore, junior, senior? I just haven't read anything like that. And I apologize if I missed it. Um, I, it, is your question, so let me make sure I wanna answer this correctly. So, um, so for example, we would have a cohort, we would have a, if, if we're doing the phased in model, we have a group um, that's group one, group two, group three, group four, 25% of, so it would be 25% of first graders um, in group one, group two. It, is that kind of what you're asking? Absolutely. Yeah, just, just curious on the division. Okay. 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 So good. I'm glad I'm on the right track. Okay. So yes. Um, so it would be across the district, it would be 25% of each grade level um, in like in group one, then group two would be another 25%. You answered it perfectly. Thank you. Oh, good. Okay. You bet. CZD. Okay, uh, this is Sinan Durbin. Um, I have a few questions. My son is um, in senior year and um, the study list was submitted last, uh, last year. And when would we know uh, if all the courses he selected would be offered? Uh, so we are looking at uh, 
courses now. Um, as you can imagine with uh, going to hybrid and, and trying to change uh, things, our master schedule is still in flux. So what we're doing is um, looking at um, re reforming our master schedule. Uh, there is a link on our return to learn plan to the courses offered through Edgenuity. Um, so if I, I'm, I'm sorry, can you, I'm gonna go back and ask you, are you asking is when, when are his in-person classes going to be decided or when are, are his online classes going to be decided? He's completed online right now. Okay. So, and he has as, well, certain requirements to, to fulfill for graduation. So my concern is that if there are any classes that that won't be offered in, in either form, we will offer, we will find a way to get him through his graduation and make sure that he graduates on time. So whether it's Edgenuity, Apex, Google Classroom, we will find a way to ensure that as he stays online, that he has access to the courses he needs to in order to graduate on time with his peers at the end of this year. Okay, thank you. And my next question is uh, for the Edgenuity uh, program, would there be a um, teacher uh, for each course as uh, when the student have certain questions like in normal, uh, under normal circumstances, they can go to their office to talk to them. Um, so for each course, would there be a uh, teacher behind it for the, for the student to, to consult and when they, when they need to, or earlier, we heard about this um, virtual room, homeroom teacher, or everything has to be uh, direct, directed to the, the homeroom teacher. So yes, you are absolutely right. Everything has to be, the point of contact for your online student is that virtual homeroom teacher. At that point, that teacher will connect with the um, content expert and, and connect uh, and get the assistance or the clarification to your student. Right. And regarding PE classes, now how do online students <laughs> fulfill the PE requirements? That is a very good question. We are still working on that. Um, we're, I think we're meeting with the PE department fairly soon to kind of iron out those finer details. All right. Okay. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you. Kimberly, go ahead. Hi, thank you very much for having this session tonight. I appreciate it, it's been very formative. Um, my question is, I have three different students in three different schools. Um, will there be some kind of um, um, harmonious um, flow so that they're all on the same schedule on going back to school and that 25% hybrid model? Great question, absolutely. That's, that's how uh, Infinite Campus will arrange it by household so that all of your students are on the same schedule and you're not like pulling your hair out going, oh, this person's going on Monday and this person's going on Tuesday. We, we, we understand that and we'll make sure that they have um, all of the same schedule. Now I know in a couple of larger family cases, we do have the ability at the building level to reassign them um, per, for specific reasons. So we'll do that on a case-by-case -case basis but generally each household can expect their their class their students all of their students regardless of level to be on the same schedule thank you and i have one more question please sure. my my other question is um my freshman will be starting at an advanced math level um is there anything i need to do to um let that be known or anything like that um to the school I think we should have that information, but you might want to reach out to, to the counselors to verify. All right, thank you very much for your time. Mm -hmm. Lisa, you can go ahead. Um, I have a question about uh, my daughter, we've chosen to do online, but I know then she can make a choice after X number of weeks to come to class. If the classes are through Edgenuity, how will she mesh into a on-site class then? Um, you know, will there be a disconnect between what she's learned and what the teachers are teaching? So we are working with teachers to go, as I think Ben Matthews uh, went over earlier, uh, to 
uh, look at the, the customize each class so that it is more aligned with what's going on in person. It won't be a 100% match for match, but it will get as close as we possibly can so that as your student perhaps decides to come back to um, in-person learning, they won't miss a beat and they won't have to have like do double the work. Okay, thank you. Paula, go ahead. Paula, you may have to unmute. There you go. We will try Krista. So I actually have uh, two questions. Um, one for, for new students that are transferring in this year of any grade, will they have an opportunity to um, get acclimated with the building, um, just find their way around. Um, and also for uh, blended families that are living in different addresses, is there a way that we can um, have all of the students on the same days to help in transportation? I'm gonna answer your first question first. Um, for new students, yes, we will have, to, we will continue to have an orientation for both freshmen as well as new transfer students. Um, and at that point, new transfer students will register and get their courses as well. Um, for the second one, and one of the other folks online might actually have a better answer, but I believe as long as they're listed as in the same household, they'll have the same schedule. So we actually asked that in registration today and um, they, we were told that because it's a different address, they can't list it as the same household. Those will be some of those ones that, I'm, um, that we will have to look at doing by hand. Um, blended households that have two different addresses, those, that's something we have discussed and um, so we just need you to email um, either. Superintendent Reisner, you, you, you made it out. That, that answers the question, I appreciate it. Uh, j just for a point of contact for you, sir. My name is Jeff Hawkins. I'm the executive director. If you want to email me, I'll make sure it gets to the right people so that we can get yeah, and Superintendent Reisner is exactly correct, right? Uh, we are going to need to solve a, a few of these household problems by hand. Uh, just so you have a point of contact, uh, feel free to email me and I'll make sure that the people who are going to solve that get get that information. Again, Jeff Hawkins. Yep, I appreciate it, Jeff. Thanks. Yep. I, I'm back on. I apologize. Thank you for taking over. Obviously, you knew what I was going to say, so thank you. Let's try Paula. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, sorry about that. I had two mutes, one on top of the other. Um, so I, I'm still trying to understand what how Wednesdays are going to work for the students that are completely online. Uh, I understand that they have to initially go through their homeroom instructor. And then if they, it, the part I don't understand is, do they actually get to talk and interact with the specialized teacher? Or is the homeroom teacher going to be sort of the intermediate messenger between the student and the te the uh, specialized teacher at this moment that that's a one of those finer details thank you for your question that's one of those finer details that we're still working on i i feel like i can say with a little bit of certainty but hesitation that your student will have access to teachers whether it's a uh, 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 office hours or um, or uh, or an other mechanism for getting face-to-face uh, -face virtual contact with that that content expert. 
Okay, because otherwise on ingenuity, the, the way I understand, I, I've never used that, I've never had any contact with it, but the, I understand that there are no teachers in there. So the only contact with teachers would be on Wednesday. If, and if, if all the interaction with the specialists is not direct, it, it sounds like a big handicap. That's why I'm really, really concerned. I understand. It's actually um, your the students will have contact with an Ames teacher who is who's also working remotely. So that would that was that homeroom teacher. They will be checking in. They will be organizing their group of students in various ways. In addition to that, your student can expect to also have contact with content experts in order to to problem solve or or reteach specific elements that your student is struggling with. Does that help? Uh, yes, it does. I'm, I'm, a, I'm still a little concerned about how much con contact they'll have with the, the specialist teachers. I mean, this is high schools. Teachers are not going to, the general teacher is not going to know the specific contact of different, high, of different classes. So I'm a little concerned about that, how, how much contact it, he will have with the the teachers that actually know the content. Understandable. I I uh, I don't know how we can answer. We're we're all very new at this, so please give us a little bit of grace. We're not quite sure exactly all of those very specific details, but you can rest assured that we will do everything we can to ensure that your student is growing and learning and and progressing um, appropriately to our content standards and learning targets. Okay, thank you. I guess one thing I could add is in the Edgenuity system, all of the um, activities, videos and such are provided by licensed certified teachers. So they are content experts that are providing the content within the system. Um, it's just there, the student would not be able to interact with that person, but they're at least receiving the information from a content expert. And then, of course, they'd be able to contact their contact teacher at the high school, and then they can get them in contact with an ex the expert to get additional support. Paul, go ahead. Yeah, I had a couple of questions. Um, is there a way for parents to test drive the Edgenuity platform prior to making the decision about going the all online route? I think we're speechless. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that is something we could have um, a director Mixdorf um, ask about if there is a, um, a sample a lot of times on their um, website they'll have like a interactive kind of video type thing that you can do um, but we we can look into that and and if so um, we can get that sent out through social media I was I was going to say the same thing so we can try to find some or we will find some of those supports um, and, and link it into some communication. I also know there'll be training for high school staff and, and maybe in our um, parent uh, meetings that week before uh, students start on campus, we can provide some of that information as well. That might be too late for the, because it's for parents to be able to make that decision. So, um, so yeah, we'll look into whether or not we can push a sample out they may have that so we can contact that com the company I had a couple of other questions that uh, i was curious how the needs of elp students get handled within the the high school this year uh will there will it be different or or how, how will you be able to uh, again meet their needs I'm sorry, that's a really good question. I'm not exactly sure uh, how ELP works. Um, does someone else want to take this question? 
more than happy to hop in. I don't know, uh, Dr. Nyberg, that I would have a more specific answer other than um, continue to work through, as you've heard, maybe uh, uh, Sir and other answers that we're, we're, we really do, um, we're working from, from broad structures to how that applies to individuals. And, and we do need to, and we are working towards answers on well, how, what is this mean for EL, ELP, Success, uh, other sp uh, specific areas of support. Um, I want to get with uh, some of our teachers in our specific buildings that have been planning what that's going to look like, uh, rather than guess at an answer for you tonight. So I, I apologize that I don't have those details. One other question that I had too was for courses where there would be like a laboratory element to them, how will they be able to facilitate those labs? Um, will, will it be the same experience as, as students would normally uh, get to see or will you have to curtail some things? We've been talking about that. Um, I would say it won't, I don't think in any lab uh, right now it will be the same as it has been in the past um, because of the social distancing required. Uh, I, we are looking at uh, simulations and other uh, ways to facilitate the same kind of learning and, and practice, um, but, but we are um, we're, I, still working out those details. I think it, it will depend on the specific class. Like I can imagine biology is going to be very, very different from physics. So um, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, does that answer a little bit? Well, not really, but I appreciate you all, you know, just taking the questions down and then working, working, working toward answers, you know, they're more developed. Uh, as Paul, you are you referring to the, the virtual classes? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, weighing both the virtual and the hybrid models and I just wanted to understand you know, how to differentiate. The, the virtual classes are all, they, they're basically all simulations. Um, they do have some like activities where the kids would like, okay, draw a line here to cut open the frog. Um, and like, okay, now pick up the, the magnifying glass to look at this. And I mean, there, there's like virtual simulations that they do um, with like Edgenuity, Apex, Odyssey, whatever. Um, just the different variety of online learning platforms? I mean, the gold standard, you know, oftentimes is being able to, to do something, you know, in a tactile way. And, and that's where I was just trying to understand if for, for those students that are gonna be on campus, you know, will you still be able to preserve that? As best as we can. Yeah, I was, I was going to hop in and just say, I'm, I'm sure that labs will need to occur, um, but there doesn't seem to be much of anything that at least I find myself after 20 years in education, finding that next year will be exactly the same. Um, uh, but I'm sure that those uh, science teachers and PLCs will be working through how to um, teach to those standards and do those labs with as much fidelity as possible. But, but I do believe it would be reasonable to expect that things just like just like lunch, just like entering the building, um, just like most lessons, things will probably look a little bit different. I've taken up enough of your time. Thanks for answering my questions. We are hitting um, that part of the night where um, actually a little bit longer than what we anticipated. We do have um, one other question. Amy, you did have your hand raised, so we will get to Amy. And then uh, Dr. Nyberg, I will give you an opportunity to wrap up this evening. Go ahead, Amy. Thank you. Um, first, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you. This is not something any of us imagined happening, and I think you're doing a wonderful job dealing with the unknown. My question is very specific, and that is, if we all go online, is edgenuity gone? No. So, well, we haven't, no. <laughs> so if, if, for example, if your student is online, they would continue, and then the rest of us go online, your student would continue to work with Edgenuity and Google Classroom in, in whatever configuration they're already working. So we'll maintain those, those uh, 
differentiation, the differentiated approaches, even if we're all online. And there'd be no option to switch back to an Ames High classroom that's offered online at that point? We haven't spoken about yeah. that. So, so yes, I mean, so here's, so here's how that would work. You would be I lost her. I'm going to try again. Uh, clearly, Superintendent Reisner is having some difficulty with her internet connection tonight, which I think we can all understand. Events. Um, so yes, uh, we I am so it. sorry. Nope, go, that's go ahead, Jeff. Uh, okay, great. It would well, just go through the process. Yeah. That's just, yeah, we're on the same page, Superintendent Reisner. That's what I was going to do. So, so uh, Amy, uh, yes, uh, we, we maintain a process uh, and a, uh, where students who are maybe beginning the year or currently online, if they want to request to move to that hybrid option, they can. I think in, in my mind, a key to your question is our... And again, there's just so many variables here. Uh, are we moving to online for everyone for a few weeks due to an outbreak and needing to quarantine? Or are we moving to online for the remainder of a semester um, due to uh, you know, the, the context in the community? I think there's a lot of variables. Um, I, as you can tell from our answers, we haven't spoken specifically about what this happens other than I agree with Dr. Nyberg's answer. We would not get rid of that edgenuity option for those people who wanted to switch to more of that hybrid option that was run through Google Classroom more than edgenuity. That option would remain. Uh, but again, systemically, we would need to examine what are the contexts around that switch to 100% online? What's the expected duration of that? And then how do we manage the logistics of those people who want to shift? Okay, thanks. I'm really thinking about when the COVID hits the fan and we're yeah. all the rest of the year online. Right. I thought that was maybe your question. That was my question. I think there's a lot of variables, um, but we, we certainly want our parents and our community to understand that, that, that there is a process and an option for parent flexibility and to change um, what that mode of delivery is uh, for them to make those decisions that they feel is best for their families throughout the process. And we would continue to try to honor that, even if the COVID hit the fan. Okay, and I think that my question also says that we all love our Ames High teachers and we want as much contact with them as possible. And I would like to say that our Ames High teachers love their students and want to have as much contact as possible. Okay, so I know, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, questions asked. There was a lot of questions answered tonight, um, but we know not not all of them. And so um, I know that Jeff Anderson was recording some of the questions in the Q&A that uh, we may not have been able to get to. And I know Dr. Nyberg, I'm sure you have a mental list at least working on, on uh, I'm sure your to-do list is not getting any smaller, but I wanna um, give you the final word for this evening. I just want to reiterate that we are incredibly appreciative to the questions that you all have um, have posed. As you can see, some of them are making us come, uh, uh, think uh, at a deeper level um, so that we can meet our students' needs. Um, we are here to support each and every student and to provide uh, the, the great Ames High traditional um, um, education as best as we can, um, given this health crisis and um, what we are currently experiencing. So uh, we are willing to work with you uh, and I'm, I'm excited that you're willing to work with us. So thank you very much. And I also wanna put a shout out to my team because <laughs> Many, many, many a nights we worked uh, to kind of iron out these details and, and provide uh, this guidance for our teachers as well as our, 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 our families. So uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say a hearty thank you very much. All right, great. Thank you, everyone, and good night.